the room can take your seats. I think we had a mass exodus to the rooms to check on the price of oil. Uh, my understanding is that it settled at 120 with trading continuing to drive it down into the toilet uh, after it uh, rocketed to the moon. So uh, that, uh, and, and here to explain all of these problems and more, <laughs> to give you all of the answers, uh, is, is a panel of, of uh, economists and, and people in the markets who will, uh, who will do their best to, to struggle with uh, what Jim Paplava, who will moderate this session, uh, has described yesterday as the most significant events of his uh, life in the, in the world of markets. Um, Jim runs a Financial Sense, uh, a, a radio show, uh, as well as he's in, an, in the investment sector. Uh, he can perhaps add a few more remarks. You, some of you heard him in the investment section uh, uh, yesterday afternoon. So please welcome Jim Paplava. He'll moderate the panel. Thank you. Uh, our first guest is Jeff Rubin, and unfortunately Jeff couldn't be here with us today, but we've got a video that we're going to play. For many of you that aren't familiar with Jeff, to me he's one of the giants uh, in the economics field. He's a guy that understands that just because the price of energy goes up, you don't magically get marginal barrels of oil. Jeff has been uh, one of the top-ranked economists in the Canadian financial markets over the last decade. Prior to joining CIBC World Markets in 1988, uh, Mr. Rubin was a senior policy advisor at the Ontario Ministry of Finance, which he oversaw economic forecasting. Throughout his career, he has worked, and a lot of his subjects have been national headlines, and he's been instrumental in raising the key issues to the national spotlight. So if we can, uh, let's have Jeff's interview. Last year in Cork, Ireland, I spoke of how we would soon face the reality of triple-digit oil prices. And despite the fact that much of the world economy is today likely in recession, we are seeing oil prices in that range. Today what I'd like to talk about is the impact of triple-digit oil prices on the world economy. In a world of triple-digit oil prices, all of a sudden, distance costs money. Where a factory is located suddenly becomes important in relation to the location of the markets that it ultimately serves. And in doing so, it challenges a fundamental premise of today's globalized economy. Globalization is, after all, just a fancy word for a very simple process, wage arbitrage. Move your factory to the cheapest labor market in the world, or even better, get out of the factory business altogether and buy whatever your factory used to produce from somebody else's factory in the cheap labor markets of Southeast Asia or China. That model, of course, required the dismantling of trade barriers, but it also required something else. It required cheap energy costs, because it meant that in order for a factory to produce for a market on the other side of the world, that transport costs had to become incidental. In fact, what we are seeing today is that transport costs are soaring. Despite all the improvements in fuel efficiency, shipping costs across oceans are today even more dependent on energy prices than they were in the 1970s during the OPEC oil shocks. The replacement of brake cargo ships with container ships has meant that ships spend more time at sea and less time at port and hence are burning fuel more often. Moreover, the speed increases in today's transport fleet means that, as in most cases, increased speed 
comes at the cost of fuel efficiency. When oil was $20, transport costs were an incidental part of shipping costs. At $100, transport costs are 40% of total shipping costs. At $200, transport costs are 80% of total shipping costs. Those increases in transport costs are soon going to turn global cost curves on their head because it's no longer a simple one equation model where you locate your factory. It's no longer simply about where the cheapest labor force is. It's now about logistics. It's about distance costing money. Those cost increases that we've seen in transport costs are the same if we express them as a tariff rate, as a tripling in tariff rates since the year 2000. At $150 oil, it will be a quadrupling in tariff rates. At $200 oil, it will be a quintupling of tariff rates. Those tariff rates take us back to a very different world. A world of the 1970s where countries didn't trade nearly as much as they do today, where their domestic markets were much more important than they are today, and where the countries that they did trade with were their neighbors, not countries halfway around the world. That I believe is the world that triple digit oil prices is rapidly taking us back to. Consider what's already happened between the cost of shipping a standard 40-foot container from Shanghai to New York. In 2000, when oil prices were $20 a barrel, it cost $3,000 to ship that container. Today, those costs have almost tripled. At $200, those costs uh, will be something in the neighborhood of around five times as much as they originally were. Well, unless that, those containers are containing diamonds or some very expensive goods, what is inside them, those prices are going to start to rise, reflecting the soaring costs of transport costs. That's already happened in as basic an industry as steel. The cost of exporting iron ore from Brazil to China to make steel and then shipping the steel from Shanghai back across the Pacific Ocean to New York has added on about $90 to the cost of producing a ton of hot rolled steel. $90 that American steel producers don't have to pay. And for the first time in over a decade U.S. steel producers are now a lower cost producer than Chinese imports. And for the first time in a decade, Chinese steel exports to the United States are plunging. They're down by about 20 percent. Now many of course will say that that decline reflects the weakness of the U.S. economy. But during the very same period, U.S. steel production is up 10 percent. It's up at China's expense because now shipping costs have made it cheaper to produce steel in the United States than in China. Yes, there is still a major labor cost advantage in producing uh, steel in China, but with today's technology, there's only an hour and a half labor time in producing a ton of steel, and that doesn't make up for the cost of transporting steel across the Pacific Ocean in a world of triple digit oil prices. Who would have thought that soaring oil prices would breathe new life into America's rust belt? But that's exactly what's happening. And it just won't be steel. It will be a whole range of goods where freight costs are a significant percentage of final selling prices. So what I think we're ultimately going to see is in a world of triple digit oil prices, many of the jobs that in America we thought were lost forever will soon be coming home. Thank you very much and have a great conference. So I guess there's some good news from all of this.
Our next speaker is Dr. Herman Franson. He has been president of International Energy Associates of Chevy Chase, Maryland since 1996. The group provides energy economic analysis of global oil markets, conducts political risk assessments, and assists companies in establishing relationships with NOCs. Please help me wel uh, welcome Dr. Herman Franson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad to be back here at ASPO. I was very happy last year to be the ASPO meeting in Cork, which was very successful, where I get, actually got my former boss, Dr. Schlesinger, invited. And that was a big sea change, because Schlesinger has a very inquisitive mind, and he does, is not easily convinced. But when he made the statement, we are all peak oilers now, that was a very big change. And it's that kind of people that we have to, uh, to convince uh, to uh, really get this message across. Um, I was uh, asked by um, Steve to talk a little bit about the um, OPEC meeting and also then the implications. And it also got me to talk a little bit about the total disconnect between the world of all of us who believe uh, that there is going to be an emerging peak or plateau and those who are not. And I tell you uh, that in Washington, and the Department of Energy is a good example, and in Vienna, the world of OPEC, there is still total disbelief. And so to quote a cool hand look, you remember that old movie, cool hand look? And then president being beaten up all the time by the, by the, by, uh, the uh, present guards and then the warden would come and say, all we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> now, we have a real failure to communicate, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when we get to, to the OPEC story. And then I will talk a little bit about the, uh, the uh, peak oil issues. So we know what happened to the price of oil. Uh, the question now is, when, it's, when it came down initially to, 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 to touch $90 a barrel, uh, OPEC members are getting extremely worried. And so at this last meeting in Vienna, the perception of OPEC was unless, at least certainly the more radical members of OPEC, unless we take immediate action and cut production by a million barrels a day, we're going to run the risk of further erosion of the price. And that was, that was a week or two before last week's uh, crash in the uh, financial markets. Well, we know that the, here you see the prices have, have dropped significantly from, from, from the peak. Now they're back up again. Maybe today is an aberration. We will have to wait a few days and see how, whether, whether the price will settle. But we, we, we have seen a very volatile market. Uh, at the same time, we have seen, and that, that worries uh, OPEC, well, this is the U.S. inventories. U.S. inventories are, are low, below the, the five-year average. And this is uh, crude oil. Uh, this is from this morning's Simmons report. Uh, we have still a lot of oil production shut in, and we see pretty much the kind of similar situation in, uh, in, 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 in the market now, or the, in the, in, in the, uh, following the, um, the hurricanes this year, as we had during the period of Rita. In other words, it's going, as Matt said this morning, it's going to take some time before it all gets back. And the worst part of it is, of course, the inventories for gasoline are extremely low. And I think this morning there was on, on, on the CNN about Arkansas, they're kind of a panicking in Arkansas, and we've seen it in other parts of the country. Uh, the uh, gasoline situation is extremely, extremely uh, difficult. And uh, as Matt said this morning, if, the, if everybody were to fill up its tank, we would be in a very critical situation. Overall, though, you look at the fundamentals for right now, the overall, the, the, the stocks in the OECD are actually above the last five-year average, uh, but most of that is in the outside of the United States. Uh, if we look at how the EIA looks at, 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 at consumption patterns, I think the, 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 the IEA and the EIA started in, uh, last year this time, they were looking at demand of about two million barrels a day this year, as did the EIA, they were at that time saying about 1.7. Now this is one, this is the latest estimate, uh, 
and it's about 1.2. I think by that time we are at the end of this year. Uh, I would be surprised if demand has been much more than half a million barrels a day globally. And next year will very much depend is how this financial crisis, whether it, 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 it will have actually a major effect on the U.S. economy and the global economy, but it could be a similar picture as this year in terms of global demand. And that is what concerns OPEC, because they look at this and they look at uh, world consumption growth weakening way below the, uh, the EIA expectations. And at the same time, they're seeing, well, this is from the, the IEA report, the uh, expectations here for the IEA is that last year, of next year, we will, you see, already come way down in 2008 from 2 million barrels a day to about 700,000. It's probably going to come down further. And 2009, instead of the uh, optimism on demand in 2007, looking at the 2008, they have become much more careful. Um, where I think directionally they are correct, as, uh, if, we, if we don't have a serious recession, is that the, 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 biggest, the biggest cut in the demand on the U.S. side probably has already come because the initial reaction, we saw the same after the shock in 1979-80, the initial reaction is cutting down on driving. But once you have done that, once you have significantly cut down and you cut down a lot of your discretionary driving, there isn't as much you can do the next year. So I think they're correct in the sense of, uh, of showing less of an impact uh, next year. And then you see in other parts of the world still grows in Asia, still growth in the Middle East. Uh, you see also that in, in, in the most recent experience that the, uh, the, the uh, demand uh, by, uh, by, by sector has been less in the transportation sector, the decline, but more outside the transportation sector. Now, this is the, how the EIA looks at, at uh, world oil production 2008. You see this huge increase in OPEC, and you see a more modest increase in 2009, uh, but on balance, a, an increase that would be substantially above the demand numbers that I just uh, quoted. Uh, here is from the IEA. IEA shows uh, modest growth in North America, basically biofuels and uh, tar sands, and then a little bit from, from deep water. European uh, still to, next in 2009, decline in the North Sea. Uh, they see some growth still in the FSU uh, and in, in Asia and Latin America. Uh, but one of the big areas of growth, of course, still the, the natural gas liquids, which are primarily from OPEC. Uh, now, this, this is important because this is from, from OPEC. OPEC believes that the call on OPEC in 2009 will be at least a million barrels a day below 2008. And that's why they want to set into motion basically an effort to, to reduce the... Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the quotas. They didn't, in fact, they haven't reduced the quotas. What they basically agreed on in Vienna two weeks ago is to leave things as they are. Why did they leave things as they are? There's enormous pressure in OPEC. OPEC is like, like NATO. You have the one big bully on the thing, that's us, in NATO, and then you have Liechtenstein on the other extreme, which is a teeny weeny little country. But both are members of NATO. But the one who really calls the shots is us. In the world of OPEC, you have Saudi, always supported by Kuwait and the Emirates and Qatar. And on the other hand, you have the kind of extremists like uh, Venezuela, Iran, and one or two others. But the Saudis usually call the shots because after all, you know, it's like Stalin said about the Pope, how many divisions can, does he have? Now here it is, how much production can you really bring to the market? And the Saudis are and have been Despite all the bad press they get in this country, but they have been extremely responsible for the past 25 years in supplying oil to the market. In fact, uh, Matt, Matt would argue perhaps against their own interest because perhaps they have been producing too much, too fast, rather than leaving some of it for, the, for a later generation. But in any case, they've done that and they've done that again. They listen to Paulson, they listen to our administration, they listen, please do not cut back production because the price would go up further and it gives the Fed even more difficulty managing uh, inflation than they would otherwise have had. And I think that played a very important role in the Saudi decision. But this again is OPEC's view. What is OPEC's view? And we look out a little bit longer as we have done this morning. OPEC's view is that non-OPEC will still dramatically increase by 10.4 million barrels a day, even excluding Angola and uh, Ecuador. And they see the demand going down. Well, most of us uh, do not believe in that, but they see demand 
going down, they see non-OPEC supply rising, they see very big growth in Russia and the Caspian, so they actually see the demand for OPEC oil not growing very much with the period up to 2020, and they're beginning to panic. They think, uh, what is this? This is, this is the EIA's view on, on surplus capacity, which is uh, a million barrels a day approximately in 2008, so still a tight market, slightly less tight in 2009 based on the EIA's estimate of Saudi capacity and of other uh, Middle East capacity in 2009. Maybe too optimistic, but this is the EIA view shared by the IEA. On the other hand, this is OPEC's view. Well, this is from the OPEC Secretariat. OPEC Secretariat, supported by their member states, because they vote on these things, believes that in 2009, spare capacity may be 5 million barrels a day. Spare capacity, rising in 2010 to 6 million barrels a day. That's what OPEC believes. And that's why I say, with a cool hand look, you know, all we have here is a failure to communicate. Because this is what they believe, sincerely believe. Now, our task is how do you convince we cannot even convince the EIA, Department of Energy, of the critical situation that we're in. With all these people here, and people like Matt, who has made it almost a, a, a life's calling to go and convince these people how serious the situation is. Now, what can we really do about it? And I think some of it was brought up this morning, is uh, really a better communication. But the, the key, my own ex experience, when you're dealing with people in, in government, in OPEC, and elsewhere, it has to be Unfortunately, the same people, the people like, like Jim, who spoke for our lunch, the people like Matt, why? They are the suits. The, the suits go to Washington and successful suits. People have made money, who have been successful uh, financially, economically. When these people go to Washington, they listen. I go as a consultant to say, well, very nice, you did good work, it all, uh, looks very good, but who are you? Uh, it, it, has to be, it has to come from people who had important positions or have important positions, and that's why it was so important that Jim Schlesinger turned out to be convinced, because that message goes around. And I think it's very important for us to really begin to influence the Department of Energy, and so far we have failed, and to influence the uh, OPEC, and there I think we are, we are much further behind. And again, thanks to Matt, because uh, Matt met Fatih Birol years ago, when he was, when Fatih was the chief economist, and nobody, including Fatih, accepted what we have been, you know, been saying here for years. But it was Matt kept hammering on them with numbers, with hard facts. Uh, he was the one actually who should be get taking the credit for for the change in the IEA's views. He, he convinced them, and then when there was a, a change, the new uh, director general of the IEA, Tanaka, Mr. Tanaka. He convinced Mr. Tanaka of the seriousness of the situation, said, listen to this guy, he is a recent convert, Fatih Birol. And you know, recent converts like a religion, they're more fanatic sometimes than the ones who are born into the religion. So uh, I think these are the, this is what we have to achieve. So we have to go, I, I talk to my OPEC friends all the time, and they didn't, they're in denial. Even though the one who was quoted several times, my, my good friend Sadat al Husseini, who was a director of Aramco, who for 15 years was the head of EMP of Aramco. So he knows every single field. He knows the capacity of every little part of Gawa, because that's what people reported to him. And I remember going to Aramco in the 1970s when it was an American company, and even at that time, very few people knew actually the total picture. Why? If you were the head of a section of Upcake, that's what you knew. And you reported to the head of Upcake, the head of Upcake knew Upcake, but he didn't know Gawa. And they always worked by that system. So when the Saudis took over, they continued that system. Very few people at the top know the real picture. And this is true everywhere in the Middle East. And so there are very few people actually know. And we have, these are the people that we have to convince. So uh, let me go back now. Where, this is just, just one thing, is where, where, where can we really do something? I've been puzzled by that and see what, when you look at, at the global market, in the global market, at least to the Department of Energy uh, publication, in, in our market, about 70% is, uh, is, is transportation, and that's the, 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 the blue part, and then you see above that the industrial part, and then the transportation, the uh, residential, commercial, and the uh, uh, utilities. On a global basis, according to the Department of Energy, and, and Matt tells me it's probably much too low, 
uh, is uh, only 50% is transportation, the other 50% is other uses. Now, what is so important in that is that when we look mainly on the supply side, but if this picture were correct and half of the world's oil is still used in uh, outside of transportation, there is, of course, where that a lot still can be done. We can back out more from power plants. We can perhaps some more substitution from the industrial sector away from oil. Uh, and that would give us another X many years, a decade or so, uh, of, uh, you know, of, of additional potential uh, uh, growth uh, in, in, in the world. As here you see, I, I did it by, by, by residential, commercial, and industrial, electricity, and transportation, the United States. And you see, the residential commercial hasn't changed much. It's mainly the houses where you were talking about, Med in Maine and other places. And they're kind of hooked on oil because there's not much else they can do right now. But, of course, there are up, up opportunities in, in the future. Electricity has come down to 300,000 barrels a day. is almost nothing out of the total. Industrial has gone up a little bit since 2000, but not very much. So the real key is transportation. And when you look at the latest study by the Department of Energy looking into up till 2030, it's again transportation because they don't see change in residential commercial, no change in electricity, no very little change in the industrial use of oil. And transportation therefore remains the key. So if we cannot solve the transportation uh, problem in the United States, the demand for oil will remain very high. We haven't been very successful. And this, if you look at the red part of it, when you see that the 450 million people uh, of the EU plus the 130 million people of Japan, they consume as much oil as 300 million Americans. And that is obviously, I think, was brought up this morning as well. It, it shows you the disparity in terms of energy use. And part of that is related to, to lifestyles, and part of that is related to uh, uh, the higher taxes they have in other countries. And then you take China and India, which are beginning to emerge now, uh, together have about 2.4 billion people, and they're consuming only about 10 million barrels a day, or half of the United States consumption. So 2.4 billion Indians and Chinese, and they like to have more. A friend of mine who works for the U.S. government just came back from a conference in uh, China, and there was a big exhibition of cars. You know, China is becoming the second biggest car producer in the world, and they want to conquer the global car market. That's one of the things they have in mind. They're going to build the biggest uh, road transportation system that the world has ever known, bigger highway system than we have. That's their plan. So what was the big success at that, at that uh, big exhibition you had for cars? Not the little European cars. The Cadillac Escalada. They loved the Cadillac Escalada. Why? Because they said it's prestigious, it's big, it takes uh, several members of the family. But then they said, what about efficiency in small cars? That's for the servants. So, they have exactly the same, the same taste that exact, exactly that we had perhaps two decades ago, and they want to catch up. And it's not strange at all. I grew up as a child in post-war Holland, and I remember that the only cars you could get were American cars, and they were beautiful and nice and perfect. And I remember looking at our company car, a big blue DeSoto, and I thought, if I ever in my life can buy a car like that, I've made it. A few years later, I went to Maastricht, our regional airport, and I saw the first aircraft land in our regional airport, the first jet. And I thought, oh, if I could ever fly to another destination, I'll have made it. So now, for every little Dutchman at that time, and they have all made it, there are thousands of small Chinese guys working very hard to get A's and A's and A's in science, technology, whatever, to get, to get where we are today. There is this tremendous drive. We had lived in Europe after the Second World War, and you've seen how the Germans came across our border and get a package of butter and eat the butter. Just open it up and eat the butter, because they hadn't had butter during the whole period of the war. This is the demonstration effect. People see how we live, they want to live like us, and forget about the small cars, forget about all this. They like to live like Hollywood says we live. So how you exchange, I think it's very difficult because this is what the latest number of the Department of Energy, you, you look back into 2030. Now, they have already priced in, they have already put in, in these numbers, you estimate the demand, 22.9 in 2030, that already has in the new CAFE standards. It's already built in, in these numbers. And on the supply side, I think they made a big mistake. They're much too optimistic because what they didn't do, we have a 30-year history in the United States 
of a decline, averaging, not every year, of 1.5 percent per year. What they have done, they reversed it. And you see here the numbers, they, they, it, it actually, the, the production start increasing again, rather than stable or, or, or declining. So if anything, this base case is, is still too optimistic, but where are we going to get uh, these, these volumes of oil? Where are we going to get these imports and at what price? So as you see, the ISA Act that the President signed only marginally impacts on the future production or consumption of U.S. oil and marginally impacts on imports. In fact, it sees imports still rising. And one of the factors that we always tend to forget, which is quite different from Europe, Europe isn't growing anymore in population. It's stagnant. People are not producing children. But in the United States, all the UN estimates, our own estimates show 0.8% growth per year in birth plus net immigration. So we're adding 10 million people per decade to our population, or more, 10 to 15. And if you take the same ratio of cars per people that we have now, that would be for every 10 million new people, that means 8 million new cars. So you can have more efficient, but at the same time you see this change in the number of cars on the road. You know, when I came to America as a student in the 1960s, I think we had about 200 million people. Now we have 300 million. And God willing, I will live to the year 2040, then we'll have 400 million people, double when I came here as a young student. So take into that account what that does to the growth of energy. And this is what the Department of Energy comes up with. Uh, so we have been the slowest to move towards efficient cars. Uh, whereas the Europeans stack the hell out of their citizens, putting, you know, we were in, was in Turkey, which is a poor country, just a couple of months ago with my wife on a holiday, and in Turkey, the price of gasoline per gallon is seven dollars, and they're driving. They're still, they're, they're, but it, it, it does reduce the size of the car. So here you, uh, a lot of things we can do to, of course, I won't go into that further savings of advanced transportation technology here that tomorrow, but this is, look at the fuel economy trends line. Look at where we are as the United States compared to Japan, compared to the European Union, where the European Union is going, where Japan is right now, and even China is doing better, Australia is doing better. We are really the only one that is to be admired is California, if, if, if they get their way. And, uh, are allowed to, to really significantly improve on, on the standards. Now, we now have the CAFE standards. This was made before the CAFE standards were uh, approved. Now we'll get to the 35 miles per gallon in, in, in 2000, by the end of, the, of this next decade. Uh, I'll have some recommendations. I'll go out of that. But part of this growth, and that's what we have to know, is, in, is the wealth of a country. We are the wealthiest country still in the world in terms of income. And you look at the bottom of the line, the emerging countries like China and India. So one of the reasons that we have such high demand for energy is that, uh, well, we, we are a wealthy country, we live well. Uh, the average dwelling in uh, Japan is about, what well, the average Japanese lives is about 1,000 square feet. In Europe is about 2,000 square feet, a little less, about 1,800. And in America it's about 2,500 square feet. And if you are uh, upper middle class and above, it's closer to 4,000 square feet. So these people, they don't need as heat as much, they don't need to cool as much, they drive smaller cars. If you live in Tokyo and you want more than one car, you have to get a permit, you have to be able to show that you can park that car somewhere, otherwise you can't buy that car. All that discourages, of course, the use. Here's another one, the historical development from primitive man to technological man. The higher you go up in terms of the uh, of advanced society, the more energy we use. And you see here from the developing world side is when you're at, at the bottom of that, like China and, and India and all these countries, there's only one way up and you, you, you may become more efficient but on, a, on a per capita, uh, on a, on a, on a uh, dollar basis, but your total energy keeps rising until you reach a certain level of uh, income. There are massive changes today in the global economy, and this was before last week. This wasn't, I didn't make this last week, we were in the middle of this crisis. We go on this massive growth, reversal of 150 years of economic history. China cannot be stopped. Despite what you heard just now, China cannot and will not be stopped. They may shift more from the export market to internal development, but China will grow and reverse 150 years of economic development in that part of the world. Uh, here, this we saw this morning, in other words, US, Canada, very high. Uh, consumption of oil per capita, the, the other industrialized countries much less, and the rest of the world even less. And so the rest of the world keeps growing, in part, as you say here, look at what China is, 
on, on passenger car ownership. And don't tell me that the average Chinese doesn't like to own a car. He likes to use the BART system, or the equivalent of it, because their equivalent in Shanghai is underused. People like to drive a car. So you will have to discourage that by, 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 by putting penalties on it. But people in China, not much different from Californians or others, we like the comforts of life, we like to drive our own car, we like to live in a big house. And here you see the car used on a per capita basis, China at 15, United States at 826. Uh, the fast and enormous growth that is expected in, in uh, the car stock, about a doubling between now and 2025, 2030, doubling of the numbers of cars on the road globally to uh, uh, about, you know, close, moving towards 2 billion cars, and the Chinese want to be number one. Uh, here you see then, if you then look at population growth, yes, that's one of the critical factors. Uh, because it, when, I, when I was born, I said when I came to the United States, when I was born, the world had just over 2 billion people. Now the world has over 6 billion people, over 6.5 billion people. UN statistics said it's probably inevitable that we're moving towards 9 uh, to 9.5 by 2050. Now, if you assume only 1% oil, the liquids demand grows, let us not call it oil, liquids demand grows, you would get 138.8 million barrels a day. On a per capita basis, it wouldn't change very much as was shown also this morning. So in other words, even if, or even if we can keep on growing in terms of liquids demand, but how do you get to 130, 940 million barrels a day of liquids? So I will show you the slide of the French Petroleum Institute. They show by the exhaustive study they did that by 2050, that global hydrocarbon liquids would be at about 50. So that's at 50, but the demand is at 140. Something will obviously have to give. Uh, so here, this is the one, uh, sorry it's in French, but I like that study, why? Because it was an exhaustive study done by the French Petroleum Institute, which is a high-tech institute, it's, it's not a, a political lobby uh, group, and based on the, their, their estimates done in 2006, they said if there were absolutely zero constraints, the industry can go in, there are no problems with people, there are no people with equipment, they think that the world actually technical peak would be around in the early, early part of the uh, 2020s. But because of all this whole range of constraints, running from people to rush the equipment, uh, to access, uh, to political uh, problems, to nationalism, they now see that somehow global uh, liquids production is likely to reach a plateau at around 100. This was two years ago. Now it's down to 95 in the estimates. The work was done jointly with Total, and the, the Marjorie, the head of the French uh, uh, Total company, should be praised as probably the first senior executive of a major oil company to come publicly saying that, forget it, let's cut out all the crap, we're never going to see more liquids production than 95 million barrels a day. Now, depending on your demand, that's just a matter of, uh, of, of, of years. Uh, we have seen this. Now, this is interesting. This comes from Ray uh, Leonard. Lee Rennert, Lee Rennert was the, uh, the chief technology officer of UCOS, and he attended this session of the Hackberg Conference. Some of you may have been there. I think Steve was there at that conference. And these regional experts then looked at what they thought that was left to be found. And when you look at it by region, it comes up to about one-third of the U.S. GS uh, mid-case estimate. Uh, I'll let these go because we have to get to some. No, we, we, we went this morning into the supply outlook. Uh, one of the interesting things that was brought up this morning too is that when estimates were made in the past by the IEA, by the EIA, they have these linear models, they project what the demand is going to be, and then they fill it up with supply. And then last year, what the EIA did, people like Sadat Al Hosseini told them, well, we're never going to produce 17 million barrels a day that you assign to us. And the Kuwaitis are going to produce four and a half million barrels a day that you assigned to us. So then they took it out of, of uh, the OPEC, they pushed the price up a little bit, and they put it in on OPEC. So when you look at last year's estimates by the Department of Energy, you'll see that marginally a lot of these countries outside of OPEC, they increased their supply outlook and slightly reduced the OPEC outlook. I don't know what they're going to do next year after the IA comes out with a much more constrained uh, outlook. Well, this we have seen before, this is a typical major oil company outlook. Uh, 
And when I asked the people who did this, I said, well, you are, you're expecting OPEC to produce up to 50 million barrels a day by 2030. I said, what's plan B? Said, what do you mean plan B? I said, well, if OPEC, for whatever reason, cannot or will not produce these volumes, what is your plan B? He said, we did not have a plan B. Uh, here you see, the, yesterday, uh, the speaker brought up uh, Syrah. I don't know why uh, always Syrah is brought up. It's as if Syrah is the only uh, center of wisdom in the United States uh, on the supply uh, of oil. Now, this is a study done by PFC, produced last year at the ESPO conference. And they have, for years, they spent a, a couple of million dollars updating their model using the same data that actually the last, last night speaker uses and that seemed, everybody seems to use. Uh, because, uh, plus their own data, and it showed that uh, basically non-OPEC, including all the, the, uh, the oil sands, tar sands, uh, about to peak, and that the growth would have to come from OPEC. But uh, what is interesting here is when they said, in our view, is that absent of improvements in recovery technologies, exploration result of a sharp increase in exploration spending, non-OPEC liquids, uh, a struggle to grow beyond 2010 and may in fact start to decline. Now, when this study was done, Angola was still a, a, a non-OPEC country. So now it's not. And uh, so the ex actually, uh, you could conclude from that that they believe that, that it has actually already, uh, the non-OPEC in the new uh, lineup has already peaked. Uh, then the, uh, I will, this is important because this is uh, from Sadat al Husseini. Yesterday we heard, uh, the gentleman from uh, Nexon, that uh, there was going to be at about 10 million barrels a day growth in, uh, in uh, production in the Middle East. Well, look at this. It's from Sadat al Husseini, the former uh, director of Aramco. Country by country, what, what his perception is of Middle East production, and he basically argues that by the early part, no long, certainly no later than the middle of the next decade, Middle East production is likely to reach a plateau, which he believes at best they can sustain for about 10 years after which it starts declining. So if the producer of the last resort isn't that kind of a situation, uh, you know that we are in trouble. Uh, he, but e even, even the, uh, the NPC study, as you see here, indicating that the average of the oil companies at that time that reported the NPC study believed that the global plateau is somewhere around 100 million barrels a day. So the consensus kind of emerging on the low side, 90, or slow, sli slightly below, on the high side, maybe 105. Uh, so I think you have to make it short. Uh, but this, this is also important because it came up several times, the restricted access to proven oil reserves, that the IOCs, the international oil companies that we blame in this country politically for all the troubles we are in, they have access to 6% of the world's reserves. They become very minor players in, the, in this game. The national oil companies are the major players, and Russia, the biggest, second biggest producer in the world, is a major player, and Russia, for all purposes, is a member of OPEC. Don't separate OPEC, non-OPEC. They are, for all purposes, a member of OPEC. Why? Because the economy of Russia and the, the, uh, has become completely uh, energy-central economy that depends on high prices of oil, because that gives them high prices of gas, which are tied to the price of oil that they export in, in to, to, largely to Western Europe. And as part of Putin's thesis, he wrote a master thesis where he actually said that we have to use the strengths of Russia to regain strengths in, uh, geopolitically in the world. Now, they are now pretty much tied up with OPEC on their perception of where oil prices should be. And in terms of natural gas, Gazprom is going around the region to try to get more and more influence in the region, they already control 40%, 35 percent of the world's gas, if they can get critical uh, assets in Turkmenistan, other countries, and assets in Iran where we cannot go in, and in North Africa, that will uh, further enhance that position. So uh, what, this is the last one here, what do I, as a, as a result, this I got from Steve, uh, as a result of the combination of technical factors, uh, in other words, geology and reservoir engineering, as a result of the shortages of people that Matt talked about, uh, 
and the, uh, the ancient equipment that has to be replaced. As a result of the move from, from large fields to smaller fields and in the larger field to enhance recovery, which even requires more people and more equipment, the constraints on access, the constraints on politics, uh, we are probably very close to a peak. Now, my peak is not the Matterhorn peak. My peak would be more like Mount Rainier. In other words, you're up now, then you go down a little bit, then you're up again, depending on what happened on the demand side and what happened on the politics and what happened on the geopolitics. And the one thing we're waiting for is the eruption of Mount Rainier, the equivalent of that. And that equivalent would be if those who really want high prices, like Russians and others, succeed in destabilizing Saudi Arabia and their production falls in 50%. Now, that, that's the Mount Rainier, that's the big explosion, or St. Helena, sorry. That's the big explosion that we'll hopefully never get. But we, as you do, as, as I do, travel a lot in the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, we have actually zero credibility left in that part of the world after the past seven years. Uh, we need to do a lot of work to improve that because if most of the remaining potential for growth is in that part of the world, and we need a transition period, realistically, of 20 to 30 years to significantly change our pattern of liquids use. We need those people. And in Rooseveltian terms, we should say they may be sons of bitches, but they're our sons of bitches. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just want to remind everybody that uh, there are more extensive bios on all our speakers here. And since we're short on time, uh, I have four pages here. So rather than go through all of it, I'm not going to slide them, but I'll give you some highlights. Our next speaker is Andy Weissman. He's editor-in-chief and publisher of the Energy Business Watch, which is a highly regarded market advisory service. It provides in-depth, cutting-edge analysis of the U.S. and global oil and natural gas markets. He's an expert on U.S. and global oil, natural gas, electricity, and coal markets, commodity trading, and has also been involved in the Clean Air Act issues, power supply planning, and emerging technologies. And once again, more extensive uh, biographies on each one of these gentlemen is available on the ASPO website. Please help me welcome Andy Weissman. Thanks very much, Jim. I've been asked to be brief, and I'm going to speak again tomorrow, and so I'm going to focus my remarks today on just two points. Uh, the first, we've been focusing appropriately uh, last night and all day today uh, on the potential shocks ahead relating to oil. Uh, I want to emphasize, though, that the, the potential crisis that we're facing really isn't just and ought not to be considered just or probably even only uh, uh, a, a potential uh, oil crisis. It's really a, price, a crisis that potentially spans the energy sector and for the U.S. economy uh, could ultimately uh, involve uh, electricity and natural gas just as much. As the graphic here shows, uh, oil only counts uh, for less than 40% of total energy use uh, in the United States, and uh, electricity and natural gas account for significantly more, 56% of the total recently. Uh, and uh, uh, if, you, if you look at what's uh, been happening increasingly, the price of natural gas uh, has been what's been setting electricity prices. Uh, over the past year, uh, at least a year ago, there was a lot of surprise expressed that, quote, energy prices weren't having more of an effect on the economy. But frankly, that was partly because people were assuming that oil was the only source of energy. Uh, electric, natural gas and therefore electricity prices were stable at that point. What we started to see uh, earlier this year was both electricity and natural gas prices starting to rise fairly abruptly. Uh, and it may not be a coincidence uh, that we started to see the economy slow down significantly when that started to happen. Uh, 
Uh, when we look going forward, uh, what to me, as someone who spent uh, much of my career focusing on the electricity and natural gas markets, is that if we look down the road, uh, we're potentially facing the possibility of both electricity nat and natural gas prices going through the roof. And the reason really is plain and should be very obvious. Uh, and that is, right now, the widespread expectation is that within a relatively few years, the marginal source of natural gas supply in the United States, and therefore the fuel that will set, that could set the price for both electricity and natural gas, is liquefied natural gas, imports of LNG. And if we look at what's actually happening in the global market right now, we're already seeing the price of LNG increasingly being set uh, close to parity with oil. Now that won't necessarily apply next year or in 2010. Uh, as you've heard other speakers allude to, much of the future expansion in global LNG supply that's going to occur at any time, certainly at any time in the next decade, is going to occur in 2009 and 2010. So for a brief period of time, we could see some moderation in prices. But if you look down the road, one of the things that's crystal clear that I'll talk about more tomorrow is that uh, there is a very high likelihood that we will see global shortages of LNG potentially as early as 2012, 2013. So if we allow a situation where the U.S., uh, as we go into the next decade, does in fact become dependent upon LNG as our marginal source of supply for natural and gas and electricity, what we in all likelihood will be facing, I'm sorry, I'm trying to skip the slides now, skip to the next slide and I guess I pulled up. Apologize, let me just get rid of that. Sorry. Um, what, what we'll be facing if that occurs is a potential doubling or tripling of both natural gas and electricity prices. And there that potentially leads us is to huge shocks to the U.S. economy, the potential for a half a trillion dollar year increase uh, in cost to U.S. consumers. Uh, and if we have the combination of that uh, and skyrocketing oil prices at the, t at the same time, that's you know, a likelihood, a blow that we can't possibly tolerate. And so my first point is really a very simple one, namely that we have to view the problem more broadly. As Herman indicated in his mark, remarks, part of what's actually been happening so far uh, and what uh, uh, many people hope might happen in the future is that we've actually been trying to, uh, that part of what's relieved the pressure on oil a little bit is we've actually been reducing uh, oil consumption and consumption in the power sector. If you look going forward, though, that's very unlikely to continue. And we, uh, instead, the pressures are likely to be just the reverse. Now, the, 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 the second point uh, that I want to emphasize really picks up, uh, it, 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 as usual, Matt in his comments earlier today uh, focused on e exactly the key issues. And one of the points that he emphasized uh, is, is the need for a sense of, of urgency and, e and just as importantly, a sense of realism in the way that we focus, th uh, th that we focus on, on, the, on the crisis uh, that we're, we're facing right now. And what, what, what I want to emphasize in particular uh, is that part of what that means to me uh, in terms of the sense of realism in particular uh, is that there's a certain tendency, I believe, I think essentially, uh, to let ourselves off too easy when we talk about potential solutions. And what I mean by that in particular, I would love personally, and I think every one of us would love personally, if in fact we could solve all our energy problems solely with energy efficiency and renewables. And maybe that's possible. But I think essentially we also need to realize uh, that we can't afford to be wrong in terms of solving our energy problems. That energy prices are exquisitely sensitive to the balance between supply and demand. And therefore it is absolutely essential that we make sure we get it right. Because if we're even a little bit short, if supply is just a little bit short of what we need in order uh, to meet our needs, we're likely to face skyrocketing prices. And therefore, 
we need to make sure that we're not just talking in the abstract about possible solutions, but we're developing detailed plans uh, that are going to be realistic to meet our needs. And that may ne means that we need to look at, at what it's going to really take and assess those the, both the potential and the limitations of the avail available options in a realistic manner. Now, what I've tried to do with that in mind is I've tried to, li to list what I think are five essential requirements of trying to realistically address both uh, our oil needs and our natural gas and electricity needs. And you would think, essentially, given the severity of the energy crisis and the attention that it's being paid, uh, and given these principles, which are really fundamentally uh, straightforward, uh, that this would be something that already would be kind of common uh, knowledge and would be exactly what we'd already be doing on the national level. But as you'll see as I go quickly through the list, uh, that in fact, uh, except for the first item, and we're only paying lip service to the first item, at the national level, we're really not even addressing uh, the, the remaining items that I'm going to cover. So what are the five items? Uh, the first, uh, clearly we need to have a sense of urgency. Now, we're certainly having lip service paid to that in the national, at the national level. Very little action uh, at the federal level uh, over, over a period of many years. The point I want to emphasize with, with, with this group in particular, I think everybody in this room understands how urgent that we, is that we address our energy crisis. Uh, but what I want to emphasize in particular is that there is absolutely no time left to delay in developing a, a comprehensive uh, program to meet our energy needs. And I say that really for two specific reasons. I say that in part because essentially what I think all of us recognize is that in a sense the question of when oil will peak and as Matt's indicated, there's a lot of evidence that's already happened. But the question of when oil will peak is really fundamentally, fundamentally a secondary issue. The issue fundamentally is a question of the balance between the supplies available and how rapidly demand is growing, and when we reach the, the point that supplies are not growing rapidly enough to meet our needs. And if you look at what's happening, essentially, we've already reached that point. We're already reaching the point in which supplies have not been growing rapidly enough to meet the needs of the economy without causing dislocations to the economy and without hurting a lot of people. And it isn't necessarily the people in this room that are being hurt. It tends to be more the disadvantaged, both in this country and around the world. Uh, and so we talk, for example, yes, growth in demand globally this year for oil is way down. The reason it's way down is because the price of oil more than doubled, and the doubling of the price of oil had a lot of effects. It, as a matter of fact, it may not be totally unrelated to the fact that the U.S. financial system almost collapsed last week. It wasn't the primary cause, but it certainly didn't help. Uh, and so we need to recognize that while it's important uh, to, f to try to evaluate whether uh, oil has already peaked or whether it might peak next year or whether it might peak in 2015, that the, the real problem is even closer at hand and exists right now. And secondly, and just as importantly, and other speakers have emphasized this, the lead time realistically for most actions to really make a difference in solving the problem is seven to ten years. So even if we're talking about 2015, 2015, the future may have been a couple years ago and certainly is no later than now. So I think we need to all get out the message that there is less than zero time to delay in taking action. Secondly, a, a second factor, you've all heard it, but I really want to underscore it even further. We can't tolerate any further having misinformation come out of the federal government. And I say that. I say that in particular, I, on a personal level, I know a lot of the senior people at EIA, I have a lot of respect for them. They're capable people, they're trying hard. Uh, they just, as an agency, they don't have the resources to do the job right. They're also too much trapped in their prior forecast. It can't be tolerated. There are a lot of people in industry who feel strongly about the same point, 
Realistically, though, the major oil companies, a lot of others, aren't going to act differently until the federal government, or aren't going to act differently enough until the federal government issues more realistic numbers. So we've got to try to make that happen. You know, this group in particular has done terrific work, Matt in particular, but many other people in the room have done spectacular work trying to get better information out. But we also have to do more. We should be pushing whoever the new president is to get the process of getting accurate information out into totally new hands, give it to the Federal Reserve Board or create an entirely new agency. But we have to get uh, something at the level of the Federal Reserve Board, an agency of that caliber and quality to get accurate information about. A third critical factor is that we have to approach energy needs on a comprehensive basis. I think, for example, Boone, credit gets, Boone Pickens gets tremendous credit for being imaginative in trying to come up with a solution, uh, or at least, at least a set of measures, to try to reduce oil uh, dependence that isn't in the box. It thinks about across um, electricity use and transportation needs by talking about using increased wind power uh, in order to reduce electricity sector consumption of natural gas and then use natural gas for CNG. But we, uh, and so I think that's kind of pointing the direction in a sense to the need to, to start thinking about cross boundaries. Uh, but in a sense also, frankly, it doesn't, floating that kind of proposal shows what a primitive level we're at. Because in advancing that proposal, there was no effort that I'm aware of at least to even begin to evaluate what does that really mean in terms of whether if we think in those terms we're still going to, can you do it from a wind standpoint, what does it really mean in terms of adequacy of electricity prices, what would it do to natural gas prices, what impacts would it have in terms of increasing natural gas prices, how would that affect electricity prices. I think the broader point is we've got to think about the two sectors comprehensively. One of the best things we can do to reduce oil dependence, for example, is potentially strongly promote electric plug-in hybrids. You heard the speaker at lunch indicate that while he had reservations about coal to liquids, that may be one of the best sources of new supplies. We've got to evaluate those options, all of which cost cut boundaries. A fourth issue, uh, I th believe at least, is that we can't ab initio rule out options. We've got to insist that whatever we do be environmentally sound, but essentially we can't continue talking at the abstract level. We've got to set up a comprehensive planning process, we've got to spit, set up uh, specific goals, and we've got to develop at the national level. What's going on is crazy, to be blunt about it. What's crazy about what we're going, of what's going on at the national level is we've got, as Matt indicated, the most serious problem we're facing, and we're talking about it in almost an amateur sort of way, in that we have no national energy plan, we have no effort to develop a rigorous comprehensive plan. We're talking about throwing out ideas. Uh, and instead, what is needed is the most rigorous planning exercise possible using the best expertise in the world. And finally, and, and uh, lastly, we, we, we have to be completely objective and closed and, and hard-nosed uh, in evaluating every option. So why, I think I've used up uh, all the time I have available, so why don't I end there? I appreciate your attention. About uh, four years ago, I came up with uh, a brilliant idea that I would take a vacation in the month of August. And there's a standing joke in our office that anytime I take August off, something bad happens. 2005, I ended my vacation with Katrina and Rita. 2006, it was the largest sell-off in the energy markets we had seen in a while, and a hedge fund blows up. Last year, it was the emergence of the credit crisis, and then this year, I started out the first week with a little conflict in Georgia. It went on to the sell-off of the resource market, and by the end of the month of August, I was getting information from my friends in New York that Lehman, Fannie, Freddie, and a few others would be toast. I came back and cut my vacation a day early 
and then we got a hurricane. So it was a pretty good record for the month of August. So needless to say, my friends have asked me if I could change my vacation time from August to some other time of the year. But it was interesting, when I came back from August, August is the time I, I take a month off, I read all the stuff I don't have time during the year, and I put all this stuff in a, I literally came back with a big mail cart, and I was sitting on my floor in my study, and I, anytime I read something, I mark it in blue, I label it, and I put it in piles, and I'm laying all this stuff in piles. In the meantime, I'm watching the television, and Gustav was coming in, and I was looking and seeing oil prices drop five and six dollars a barrel. Well, I'm going to kind of hopefully shed some light on this, because when you have leverage in a society, and you have to delever, a lot of things happen very quickly and can generate their own momentum. When I came back, there were four concepts that I had boiled down, uh, boiled down on my reading. One was the economy was getting better. That was a lot based on the second quarter GDP numbers were 3%. Secondly, the credit crisis was over because we saw that in the month of July. Third, vacation, or inflation rates were coming down. And four, the commodity bubble had burst. So I want to just take you through just a couple slides here. We were getting through or what economists were saying the muddle through. You know, there's some problems out there, but we're going to get through. But you can see the year over year annualized rates of change in the economy were definitely slowing down. One that I pay attention to is called the Chicago Fed National Activity Index. It's 85 indicators and includes most of the major categories of our economy, production and income, employment, hours work, personal consumption and housing, sales, orders, and inventories. This gauge has predicted every single recession in the last 50 years. Anytime that gauge drops down to a negative 0.7, we've had a recession. So whether NIBR calls it a recession or not, this indicator is definitely flashing that we could be heading into a recession. That's followed up by the Federal Reserve uh, State Coincident Indicator, which has all the 50 states. They monitor key variables in the economy, payrolls, average hours of manufacturing, the unemployment rate, real wages, and salary. And if you can just take a look at those arrows, with all due respect to Larry Kudlow, that is not Goldilocks. I want to move on to the credit crisis here. And I don't know if we can push this up a little bit more. Um, but these are estimates in terms of losses coming forward. And the middle column, you can see announced write downs by each sector in the financial industry and the amount of capital raised. Uh, the, the figure on the bottom is $2 trillion. We have written off, as of last week, $514 billion. And if you have a professional Bloomberg, you can follow this. You just type in WDCI, and they monitor this every single week. This is what it looked like as of last week. Worldwide, $514 billion worth of losses, $261 billion a year. And then you can see the name of the firms, so you can see some of the trouble that they were talking about in August as it was emerging. And one of the problems that you have in this kind of a crisis, in the first phase of the crisis, we had the write downs and then we had the capital raises. And one of the reasons I think you're seeing some rescues now is how do you raise capital? Because anybody that contributed or raised capital has lost almost half their uh, amount of money. So now they're talking about bailouts. And any of you uh, were watching the conferences with the Federal Reserve Board in February or uh, July, can't think of the senator, but he said, well, he was talking to Bernanke, and he said, well, you've loaned out half your balance sheet. The next crisis, when you loan out the other half, what's next? Monetization. And kind of, that was kind of like looking around and not, not something they want to analyze. But it's amazing. They're talking about raising $700 billion now for this bailout, and the national debt limit is going to be increased by over $2 trillion. So that tells you a little bit of what's coming. There is the national debt. We just added about $5.2 trillion onto that with Fannie and Freddie. And one of the things about the mortgage crisis, believe it or not, the subprime, most of that has been written off. We're going through the alt A's, and we're seeing a little bit, as we saw with AIG, with credit default swaps. 
Another problem hits us, and this is what I call the perfect financial storm. We're going to be dealing with this credit crisis at the same time the energy crisis is upon us. And unfortunately, Ben and Hank can't manufacture oil barrels. And so if we take a look at from 2005 and 2007, especially here in California, a good amount of the uh, mortgage lending was done with option arms, which allow the homeowner to pay a below market interest rate, add the difference onto the balance sheet on the loan, so the loan is increasing. And these contracts are set over a five-year period. They adjust once a year, about 7.5%. And then at the end of five years, full amortization, full reset of mortgages hits. And that hits from 2010 to 2012. And you can see there where we are right now. And as I mentioned yesterday in my talk, when David Walker, comptroller of the currency, said, we're facing a crisis here of unbelievable... Uh, uh, crisis that is going to unfold in this next decade. And he was talking about the baby boomers, 78 million of us that are going to be heading into retirement. By 2017, that's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 80 uh, million of us at a cost of $50,000. That's an annual outlay of $4 trillion. So you had two choices to head this crisis. Just like the energy crisis, where our politicians in Washington aren't really facing this. One, was you raise tax rates 44% now, cut government spending 20%. Just imagine how well that would go over in the present presidential campaign. Wait to the next decade where you can raise taxes 88% and cut government spending 41%. So you can see the magnitude of this crisis. Here's another one that I find rather interesting, especially when people start talking about deflation. This is the 10-year uh, Treasury note, the Consumer Price Index on the left, and you can see there in the 70s, there were peaks where the inflation rate was above the bond yield, and that is highly inflationary. And even today, where some people uh, have suspicions about the current CPI index, you can see once again that the CPI index is well above the 10-year bond yield. And by the way, they jumped today. Uh, we're on the way closer to 4%. Here's another one called, I call this one, inflation in the pipeline, and this is the producer price index minus the federal funds rate. And you can see where we were back in 74 and 75 on the left side of that graph, and where we are today, we're marching up in that order. So there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline that sooner or later as a company, you either have to pass that on to consumers, or you're going to see your margins shrink significantly, and if you keep it up indefinitely, you go out of business. Now, let's talk about global money supply. And I love my fellow deflationists when they talk about money, but you can see there, that's all double digits. And it's about ready to get ramped up. New Zealand has cut interest rates. China has cut interest rates. They've lowered bank reserves. They're talking about cutting again. New Zealand, Russia, all of them. In fact, uh, one of the members of the Central Bank of Russia is talking about we ought to be willing to tolerate 15% inflation rates over the next 12 months. Now, here's my favorite. I was interviewed by the Wall Street Transcript and then by Barron's, and they were talking about the commodity bubble bursting. And I was trying to explain Charles Kindleberger's book. Whenever you have a bubble, there's two things that happen. You have prices going up, but eventually as prices go up, you have supply that comes online, whether it's technology, computers, broadband, or real estate, and eventually that supply overwhelms price and you have a decline. We'll just take a look at there at our grain supplies up in the left-hand corner, probably at some of the lowest levels that we've seen in about three or four decades. And even though building has pulled back and some of the inventories in copper have gone up, you can see where we are today versus where we were 10 years ago. And one, as many of the speakers here at this conference have alluded to, there are our gasoline inventories. My wife still doesn't understand why I want to buy a Prius. It's not that we can't afford to buy gas. I think it's a point where they say, here's your ration card, and the average family gets 20 gallons or whatever that figure is going to be. You better have a fuel-efficient car, a golf cart, a motor scooter, or something. Finally, this is, I, I think, a fascinating one, which is, we can see there, the rig count, and then what has happened to the production of petroleum over a period of time. And then finally, 
the increase in population which we've seen over the last century was all due to energy. The ability to move people off the farm, farms became more productive, all the things that we could create and grow our society, including providing more food. So with that in mind, I think, uh, did I do that in five? <laughs> we'll jump. That's Thank great. You. Thank you. I've been uh, pawing through the questions while uh, uh, Jim was speaking, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass along a couple. Andy, here's one for you. Um, you made a comment about the disadvantage being hit the hardest in the U.S. and elsewhere. How can serious impacts overseas come back to affect us seriously in the U.S.? Uh, this is almost totally ignored in the media. Well, I, th I, I think we're We've already seen uh, that uh, oil, that high oil prices are uh, are, are causing a lot of uh, disaffection uh, around the world, uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, could potentially uh, cause uh, a, a lot more uh, political turmoil and greatly complicate uh, both greatly complicate U.S. foreign policy and potentially lead to. Uh, significant uh, further uh, disruptions in in uh, oil supplies. Essentially, uh, we have an increasingly unstable situation developing, which is, is fairly frightening. Uh, is there, uh, I think this one's for you probably, Herman, is there any evidence of dissension within the EIA? It's, is it time for regime change? Do politics drive their data? Well, it's like Jim said, a lot of good people in that organization. The question is if you have a system that was built on a linear demand model, you get the same results whoever is in charge. So you really have to overhaul the whole approach. And for years I have been asking them, I said, well, why don't you do it this way, but at the same time add another scenario where you look at the supply constraints and then work it back from the supply constraints, what that will do to price, and then feed that back into demand. But they've never done it. Uh, perhaps the hope is that the next person who runs that organization, uh, runs the Department of Energy, will actually uh, promote that kind of a view. Um, question uh, from Dick Vodra. Can the Chinese, Russians, and others decide the U.S. will be, quote, energy independent, end quote, by restricting our access to imports. Well, restricting access to imports is done through the price mechanism. <clears throat> what, what strikes me so much is that the latest EIA forecast but already incorporated the CAFE standards and the biofuels uh, still come out with these huge oil import numbers as late as 2030. And then you think, well, what actually is necessary is perhaps something like California has been indicating is required, much stricter CAFE standards. But you try to convince the political leadership today in the land that CAFE standards have to be dramatically improved over and above what we just agreed to in, in, in ISA 2007. It would be very tough. But otherwise, I think the price mechanism will do it, as it has done this year. I, I, I guess I, I, I think, you know, I'll I, I put it this way. I, I think we should learn a major lesson. I think Matt would, would talked about this uh, uh, it, at, uh, um, it, in some senses in his remarks earlier today. We, we, we should learn a huge lesson from what's happened in the last week. The last week should unsettle us tremendously. Uh, we saw disruptions to the, to the U.S. financial system that w really were unfathomable. Uh, and the difference with energy is that if you get underneath the, the cover and look and take a realistic view of supply and demand, it's easier to predict what's going to happen. Uh, and I guess fundamentally, uh, Matt's company, for example, has done some work within the last uh, three months. Uh, I've got a slide on, it, on this tomorrow. Uh, just doing uh, a, a, a terrific job, but doing a hard-nosed assessment uh, 
of what's actually happened with supply projects, oil supply projects, over the last several years. And based on looking at the data carefully, that, that study demonstrates, I think, rather clearly that it's absolute, and, and Peter Wells' presentation last night was fairly consistent with this, that it's kind of ludicrous not to expect significant declines in non-OPEC production uh, immediately. Uh, and I think when you recognize what the consequences of that are, what it says to you is that we've got an immediate severe uh, crisis. We can't solve it by refusing to take uh, oil imports. Uh, we've got to take a whole series of drastic action. And I think uh, what the last week should say to us is that we're talking about the wrong set of solutions right now. Uh, that just as we were talking about at a much too abstract level about how to deal with the subprime crisis two weeks ago, that we need to be talking about the impending oil crisis in a whole different way. Um, are there opportunities in the U.S. to moderate oil demand by taxing consumption? Please describe any viable, and I believe the word viable now takes on different meaning, please describe any viable scenarios. Well, I think if you were to, I was in the, worked for the Congress in the 70s, um, we, under the Carter administration, they were looking at actually putting a gasoline tax on, and a graduated gasoline tax. There wasn't a chance, you know, not a snowball's chance in hell to get that through, because any congressman who would vote for that would be on his way out. Now, that may have changed, but the American, the average American family is stretched to the upper limit. Now, you're going to come out next year when there's even more stretch with high food prices, high prices of fuel, and you, high credit, and you're going to tell these people, listen, we're going to tax you even more, and then on top of that, because of global warming, we're going to slam on an, an, uh, an additional tax so that your electricity costs go up 50% over the next several years. You try to get reelected in that kind of a world. It's next to impossible. We had a number of questions about coal and natural gas. We have sessions upcoming that will deal with those, so we'll defer those questions. Uh, one here on the uh, uh, commodities. If the market is so sensitive to the marginal availability of commodities with nonlinear and disproportionate price swings, is the market not a good allocator of resources going forward? Punt. Uh, you know, the one thing I've, I've always been amazed watching the commodity markets uh, in probably this last August and September is I think we have, as Matt has talked about, we have lack of good information. And then also you got to remember there are a lot of people that go to school on Wall Street that learn these linear curves, supply demand curves in their economics course, and they just think the price goes up, the supply goes there. It's much like the IEA uh, demand estimates, uh, you'd have this demand and magically the supply would be there. And I think that's what happens in the markets. And markets, 90% of the time are illogical and about 10% rational. And that was Jesse Livermore, and I think that's what you see. There's a perception. In July, when we had oil at over $140 a barrel, we had gold on the way to 1000 how did the world change in four or five weeks? <laughs> I mean, did we find another Gar War? Did we find another North Slope? We didn't find any of that. But if you watch television, if you watch the pundits, hmm. the market's perception, and that's very important to understand today. Hmm. You have a gazillion eyeballs. Everybody has a laptop, a computer, a charting program. And if the chart says this, everybody can tell you what the <laughs> chart says, but they can't tell you what's behind the chart. Hmm. And so today, where you had oil gap up, they shut the exchange for about five minutes, and it was at 1.30 because of the imbalances. All of a sudden, the perception falls in, and that's the way markets work. Eventually, over time, if you leave markets work, they do work. Price will ration, and we get rationality in the market. But remember, just like Jeff, Jesse Livermore said, 90% of the time, you are dealing with irrationality in the market, and that's helpful helps explain what's going on now. Steve, can I comment on that sure. briefly? I, I, I guess I, I uh, emphasize a somewhat different point, um, and, and that is I'm, I'm less sure 
that it's a problem of, of ir irrationality, maybe sometimes, and today in particular, certainly shakes one confidence in, in how uh, the commodities market functions. I think the fundamental problem, uh, and this, this is something really, frankly, I've, uh, I learned mainly from Matt, but I won't try to put the words in his mouth because I may mischaracterize them, uh, but uh, 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 essentially that markets have an incredibly short-term focus and that that f fundamentally, the mismatch is this. I believe that markets can be very, very powerful, but they're very powerful in achieving short-term rationality, and this is a long-term problem. And so there is an utter, total mismatch in that respect, and therefore, if we rely only on the markets to solve energy problems, we're going to be extremely disappointed. I think the point was raised, uh, I was told uh, that uh, yesterday, the, well, the, the question came up actually about free markets, and I guess Dick Vodra said, uh, what free markets? That would be an interesting enterprise or something <laughs> to that effect. Um, if, if Herman, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, end with this question. If OPEC really understood peak oil, do you think they would vocalize their concerns to IEA, OECD, and the rest of the world? Uh, I doubt that very much. It would not be in their interest. I think what they would do is what the Kuwaitis pretty much have determined, quite in contrast to what we heard yesterday evening. The Kuwaiti parliament said, we believe, A, that our reserves are much lower than the officially booked reserves. We see the BP statistics. The government has been lying to us for years about this. Now we have to uncover the reality. We want major studies done to find out what's happening and we actually want production to decline so that we can stretch out available supplies much longer. Now, if they were all rational, every single one of them would either freeze the current level of production or lower it, because any rational person knows that within the next 20 years, 30 years, there is no substitute for oil in the transportation sector. At the margin, there is a supplement, but there is no substitute. So if they were smart, that's how they would act, but they would never tell us. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, please uh, show your appreciation to this panel. <laughs>